Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Bee Culture. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flatham. Hey, Jeff and Kim. Today's sponsor is Global Patties. They're a family-operated business that manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. It's a good time to think about honeybee nutrition. Feeding your hives protein supplement patties will ensure that they produce strong and healthy colonies by increasing brood production and overall honey flow. Now is a great time to consider what type of patty is right for your area and your honeybees. Global offers a variety of standard patties as well as custom patties to meet your needs. No matter where you are, Global is ready to serve you out of their manufacturing plants in Airdrie, Alberta and in Butte, Montana or from distribution depots across the continent. Visit them today at www.globalpatties.com. Thank you, Sherry, and thanks to Bee Culture for continuing their presenting sponsorship of this podcast. Bee Culture has been the magazine for American beekeeping since 1873. And a quick thanks to all of our sponsors whose support enables us to bring you this podcast each week without resorting to a fee-based subscription. We don't want that, and we know you don't either. Make sure to check out all of our other content on our website. There you can read up on all of our guests, read our blog on various aspects and observations about beekeeping, search for, download, and listen to over 200 past episodes, read episode transcripts, (laughs) leave comments and feedback on each show, and check on podcast specials from our sponsors. You can find it all at www.beekeepingtodaypodcast.com. Hey, Kim, you know they've got the bees out in the almonds, and Southern California's the new snow winter playground. What are you hearing? Oh, I think climate change is here to stay. I'm hearing interesting things from up there. It's cold. Uh, snow on almond blossoms, not something you see very often. Beekeepers are Beekeepers are doing pretty good. They don't have enough bees. I'm hearing. Well, that's always the case, isn't well, it? They're always searching for bees, and there's bees being stolen from yards, and it's a mess. Even this year, they took out a lot of acres of trees that they're not, you know, they don't have to pollinate, and they're still looking for more. So it'll be interesting to see what the crop is. I, I have not seen any maps to show how how widespread the snow and, and cold has affected the almonds, but the uh, almond bloom. So, but it'll be interesting because it has a national impact for later in the season for all other pollinators yep. so it'd be interesting you have an exciting weekend planned there in Wooster, ohio don't you with the tri-county beekeepers meeting tri-county yep uh friday night and saturday this weekend and uh jim too and i'll be there talking about uh, of course the podcast and uh, uh jerry hayes is the primary speaker so it'll be good to see i haven't been to a a walk-in bee meeting in a long time. It'll be good to, you know, we went last year to Tri County. That's the last one I went to. So it'll be good to get in there and rub elbows with some people. You were a young man the last time you went to a beekeeping meeting, weren't you? Yeah. <laughs> Tri County was the first larger regional meeting I ever went to, and uh, it, it holds good memories for me. So. Yep, yep. Coming up on today's show, we have uh, Nina Bagley. She's writing a series of articles on women in beekeeping. You've met Nina before? Yeah, well, you know, she was at that uh, program that Jerry put on back here a month or so ago when he had brought in people from all over. She was one of them that came in. He had inspectors mm-hmm. from and researchers from all over the U.S. And this was the first time I'd ever heard her talk about this subject. I've been reading her articles, but I was really intrigued with the way she put on a, her presentation. So I'm kind of looking forward to talking to her. All right. Let's talk to Nina in just a few moments after these words from our sponsors. Spring brings wild and unpredictable weather. To limit the chance of colony starvation before your first honey flow, it is vital to add Hive Alive fondant now. In a cold snap, bees can starve because they cannot access their stores. When you place fondant right over the cluster, food is accessible for your bees when they need it. Now is the perfect time to stock up from a wide selection of high-quality 
quality honeybee feed supplements, you can choose from Hive Alive's liquid blend to our Hive Alive 15% real pollen fondant patties. Our unique liquid blend has seaweed extracts, thyme, and lemongrass, and is scientifically proven to maintain low disease levels. You'll have more bees with improved bee gut health and more honey this season. To learn more about each of our quality products, visit the website www.usa.hivealivebees.com. Be sure to use the code BTP at the checkout to receive your special discount. Hey, beekeepers! Many times during the year, honeybees encounter scarcity of floral sources. As good beekeepers, we feed our bees artificial diets of protein and carbohydrates to keep them going during those stressful times. What is missing, though, are key components. The good microbes necessary for a bee to digest the food and convert it into metabolic energy. Only Super DFM Honeybee by strong microbials can provide the necessary microbes to optimally convert the artificial diet into energy necessary for improving longevity, reproduction, immunity, and much more. Super DFM Honeybee is an all-natural probiotic supplement for your honeybees. Find it at strongmicrobials.com or at fine bee supply stores everywhere. And while you're at the Strong Microbial site, make sure you click on and subscribe to The Hive, their regular newsletter full of interesting beekeeping facts and product updates. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the show. Sitting across the virtual Zoom table right now is Nina Bagley. Nina, welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast. Thank you. Hi. Great to see you. Nina, we've invited you here today to talk about your column in Bee Culture about women in beekeeping fascinating articles. Before we get started, Nina, tell me about what you're doing with bees and beekeeping right now. Where are you and how long and all of that? Okay. I've been keeping bees about 20 years. I'm an urban beekeeper in Columbus, Ohio, in German Village. And I worked with a master beekeeper for eight years to teach me how to raise queens. I've taken Joe Lackshaw's class on instrumental insemination And I've also taken the uh, master's from the University of Montana with Dr. Berman Shank. And I educate in the city here. I run about 50 beehives. I'm in the Metro Parks, the State House at the Franklin Park Conservatory. And I just want to educate everybody in the city and try to get diversity in Columbus and I started getting into the history years ago from a friend who gave me a couple of old um, gleanings. And then I started, you know, buying them online. And then he left me a whole bunch of his books. And then Jim Thompson also gave me a bunch of the women. My background was fashion designing and I love history. And that's, I started because I saw the ABJ 1891 book that I have with Lucinda Harrison and her bee dress and veil underneath the veils. And then when COVID hit, I just started reading them more and going through my archives. And I always have wanted to write a book on these women and bring them to life instead of just what's been documented, make them more like your friend, like my ghost friends and bring them to life and find out more about them and their families. So I started doing ancestry and calling historical societies on the women that I would pick And then I just started with Harrison and it went down the line when I'd find out she'd have a friend, Mrs. Tupper, and then another friend, Mrs. Axel. So I just started putting them all together by the dates that they were born and how (laughs) they were an asset to beekeeping. It also sounds like you could probably give us some good information on urban beekeeping if you've got that many colonies in downtown Columbus. Yes, I could. (laughs) Yes. Are you running any on uh, rooftops? No, no, but I do inspect a couple downtown on the rooftops. I am the Franklin County Bee Inspector. The State House, we do really well there. They they put up a cage and they painted the hives that look like the State House. So we name them after famous women. So yeah, it's pretty interesting. (laughs) I know I mentioned this to you before, but I probably passed by some of your beehives last summer when I was, my brother and I were cycling from Cincinnati to Cleveland. And we rode right through the middle of Columbus and up from the southwest up to the northeast. I'm sure I saw some hives. It must have been yours. 
you probably did because I paint them all green because I am in the city and I don't want them to stick out. I'm in the cemetery, Greenlawn Cemetery. <laughs> and, you know, my friends kind of laugh at me, but yeah. I do really well. They don't spray. They get all the natural wildflowers from the river and I get black locusts. So it's I'm in the bees all the time. That's what I do in the bees every week, every other week. So I, I live for the bees and I help a lot of people with their bees. There's got to be jokes about graveyard honey. Uh, I just. Yeah. My, <laughs> that, well, that my, would be quite, my dead quite honey, the label. my skull head honey. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be quite the label. <laughs> <laughs> but they do really well. And you know why? I think I have a theory about why they do so well in Greenlawn Cemetery. Sue Kobe used to have her bees back there when she was at Ohio State. And the Garden Club, the Child's League, allowed me to go there and they donated $10,000 to Children's Hospital and my name to pollinate. And they let me pick my spot and I found that Sue's old beehives were back there. It was like an old abandoned shipyard. It was really cool. <laughs> I thought, wow, this is, and that was another reason because she's, she's so cool, Sue. She's a woman beekeeper. And I thought, gee, here's my first woman, you know, that I can like find out about. So I, I always tell everybody that, my queens come out of there are really big and great and beautiful. They are. And I, and I say it's because of Sue's genetics. So, Well, who do you want to talk to us about today? What famous woman is at the top of your list today? Today, I'm actually working on a woman called Nina Scott, and she's from Henry, Missouri, Clinton County, Missouri. And she was in Gleanings. A gentleman wrote an article about her. She ran 85 hives, and she was a good beekeeper, but I can't find any pictures on her. Her sister was a beekeeper. I've, I'm finding through the Historical Society that her family started in 1835 in Missouri. So I've got a lot of good history on her, but I, I can't find pictures. So she'll, she's coming up next. You know, I'm going to interrupt you for half a second, and, and that's because magazine these people were writing for way back then was called Gleanings and Bee Culture. And if you haven't been keeping bees for only three or four years, you might not know that. It's just bee culture. So when you say Gleanings, folks, he's talking about the original Gleanings and Bee Culture published by AI Root Company. Yes. And I'm glad you said that because my I'm in these books all the time and I call them Gleanings and Bee Culture. But yes, it is Bee Culture. And these women that I um, found, like Mrs. Harrison, she wrote for them all the time. She started with Mrs. Tupper. Ms. Tupper wrote an article, but unfortunately, she she was arrested for forgery in 1876. So she kind of faded out and Miss Harrison took her spot and started writing. And then through Miss Harrison, Miss Axel came and all of these other women. And they had a story to tell because the men like Langstroth, Daydont, I'm going to mess his name up. Johan Zizerjan, Zizerjan, they all studied these books from these men and and followed them and read them like, you know, like the back of their hand until they really understood beekeeping. So they were intelligent women. They were strong. They had grit. They made money selling honey. They sold queens. So all of these women ran a hundred hives and they would rather run a hundred hives than work in the kitchen under the heat and cook and do the ironing. So I think that's pretty cool. Mrs. Axel was lame and she still did all of the bee work. She didn't have any children, but she hired she hired help. But she was lame on the right side of her arm and she was practical. A.I. Root said she was very practical because she would carry everything on her when she'd go to the bee yard. So she didn't have to go back and get anything. And she <laughs> felt that you should have grass around your beehives and cut the grass instead of straw, because if you drop your smoker, you could catch your house on fire and your hives. And I I believe that. I thought that was kind of neat. Was that a common practice at one point to spread straw around? Yeah. And they would, some of the women would actually almost burn houses down or burn their dresses. Their dresses would catch on fire. And we think we have problems. Yeah, yeah. really? <laughs> yeah. But it, but they just to, to get around like Mrs. Harrison, she she was a woman of means. So she had a phyton buggy and she could go 60 miles to visit her friend, Miss Chaddock. They all were in Illinois, but still, could you imagine the, the bumpy roads and 
taken a trip like that and she was exhausted when she'd get there. What I did find out about all these women and the men, which I thought was kind of interesting, they all had health problems. They all were sick and the bees working the bees and getting the bee stings made them feel much, much better. Mrs. Harrison's husband, it took him 10 years to realize that beekeeping would add 10 years to your life in the stings. He finally, you know, came aboard with her and helped her with her beekeeping. Hmm. Well, he finally woke up. Yeah, it took him 10 years, but and, and <laughs> it, it, they did. They would sting themselves and they felt so much better. So some of these people were raising queens, you said, selling honey. Were they advertising in the journals? Yes, they were. Mm -hmm. You had Mrs. Atchley. She was the biggest queen woman, and she advertised all the time. She went out to California, and she advertised out there as well. Just out of curiosity, what did a queen sell for back then? When was back when? About the date? 1871 is when they started getting the bees, the women. So around 1880, Mrs. Tupper joined up with Daydont, I think in 86, they went to Italy to bring queens back and it didn't work. The queens had died when they came into New York and they only had a few of them that had survived. They were $20 a queen back then. That's a lot back then. That's a lot of money. So that kind of didn't pan out. It fell through, you know, I think it was Adam Grimm. He was a big queen seller. And he was also bringing queens back from Italy. And he was selling queens to Mrs. Harrison. So she was buying queens from him. She bought her first two hives from Adam Grimm. They were Italian bees. And all the women loved Italian bees. They didn't want the black bees. One lady would call up and she would say, she wrote into the call up, I said, but she would call, she would write the, to the newspaper and she um, complained because her neighbors had black bees and she did not want them mating with her Italian bees because she didn't want any hybrids. Was there a behavior difference between them? They didn't bring in as much honey. The Italian bees were, they built up faster and they would bring in more honey. Well, it hasn't changed much then. and. A hundred plus years. A lot of uh, things happen. Yeah. Do they ever go into a difference between the Italians and the black bees in wintering? Was one better than the other? They felt that the black bees, they, they wintered a little bit better. They didn't go in as a big cluster when they would put them in their cellars. They would bring them in and the black bees would do a lot better. But then again, when they bring them in the cellar, the cellars would flood. And a lot of times your bees would just be floating around like a fishing <laughs> bobber. And <they laughs> Take a run down to the cellar to check on the bees and bring your waders with you. Yeah, they had to have men with boots and poles to get them out. <laughs> As you read about how they were taking care of their bees, you said not much has changed, but there are there things that they were doing then that we mostly don't do now or vice versa? You know, is there some kind of standard practice that eventually they decided wasn't as good as it could be or was harming the bees? I think a lot of the women, they were using American hives and chafe hives. So a lot of them started doing Langstroth and they, they did a lot better with the Langstroth hives. But really nothing, nothing has changed. They built boxes to put over them. I make a hive cover to put over my bees for the winter that I had designed. And they did the same thing. They would make boxes. They would make shelters for them, just like we're doing, which I think is kind of neat. That hasn't really changed to keep the wind off. They apparently knew that the wind was really bad for the bees. You mentioned a chafe hive. Yeah, the chafe hives. Yeah, what is that? It's a big hive. And from what I understand, it had sawdust like in the top on the top to keep the moisture, keep it warmer. They would put wool or burlap on the top, which we don't do now. We're using styrofoam. I, I don't, but some beekeepers do do that for their bees. I don't insulate them like that. I know some people do. They had mice problems. They had robbing problems. The swarming was kind of neat because they, didn't, they could get packages like we could get packages, okay? So they waited to get their bees from swarms. So if they had a lot of bees, they were worried that their bees would swarm. So when they would go to church or they or work, they would hire young kids to sit in their fields and wait for the swarms 
so that these young kids, they'd pay them that could catch the swarms. And many times they would run out of church, you know, after the swarm. And I think that was the only time that the preacher would let him run out of church. <laughs> and he would always say, you know, is it swarm season? Is that is it this time again? Because they would just run out after their bees. Of all of these people that you've been reading about, were any, some, most of them successful enough that this was their sole source of income? All of them were. Mrs. Axel had 180 hives and got in 1882, 39,000 pounds of honey. Miss Harrison sold her queens. She sold only comb honey. A lot of them only sold comb honey back then. The belief was that if it was liquid honey, it had been diluted with sugar syrup or something. It came in the cook. That's right. And that that goes back to Lizzie Cotton. She got accused of honey adulteration or or putting, you know, selling bad honey. You're well, right. Some things have I never changed. Have I they? didn't know that. But now I get that. That makes sense, Kim. <laughs> now I understand why. OK, because I'm like, all these women do comb honey. Why so much comb honey? And they were big on clipping their queen's wings. They clipped and clipped because that way. The, the one lady that I had just done, Miss Acklin, I think she was like the smartest one. She said she was not going to go chase the swarm when she's in church. She clipped the wings. That, that queen would be there when she gets back. If she had a cow that fell in the mud, the cow would be there when she got back. So she, <laughs> she, <laughs> she was kind of funny. So, yeah, they would clip the wings and they would find their queen. That makes sense. And there's a lot of people that still do that. Of all of these women, and I guess you've mentioned some that were less than ideal behavior wise, but who's your favorite? Oh boy. I used to think it was Mrs. Harrison. It's kind of hard because there's so many. And I just found a woman, Mrs. Fowles from Wisconsin, and her article's not out yet. And she was from Oberlin, Ohio. I had had a picture of her and her family and I had it for like a year. And then finally, I was reading an article and I started putting two to two together with her family. And it's kind of a neat story because it's five generations. I found her grandson and he sent me pictures of the family and the Model T Ford that her grandfather used to get for the honey. So that I, I think that one's she's pretty cool because the father worked those girls like like boys. He didn't have boys. So he he depended on these girls. They didn't get married till they were like 37. So the one sister never did. But I think the Fowls, Iona Fowls from Oberlin, Ohio, I really can't say because I'll tell you, they all had grit. They all had, they've become like my friends with, I figured their personalities out from ancestry and what they were like. Mrs. Chaddock, she was grumpy. She wasn't politically correct. She was kind of jealous of her friends because she had a mortgage and three kids and the other woman had means. So she was always complaining, but she had very nice honey and she was a Quaker and she was really good at going out and finding succulents and educating her, her children. She was a poet and a humanitarian. So she, you know, they all had their personalities. Hold that thought for a second, Nina. we got to let our sponsor come in here for a second. We know you have options when it comes to shopping for beekeeping supplies. What we believe sets Better Bee apart are three things. First, our commitment to innovating, trying out new products in our own apiaries, and then sharing them with you. Second, our focus on education and helpful customer service. And third, but not last, our fundamental company goal – to help you be a successful beekeeper. Give us a call to learn more about any of our products or to ask a beekeeping question. We've got you covered. Visit betterbee.com to shop online today. Okay, so you've got a favorite and you mentioned Wisconsin and Oberlin. Oberlin, Ohio and Wisconsin. That's my home state. Do you recall where she was in Wisconsin? Madison. Yes. Hometown. <laughs> yes. And what was really kind of cool about her, she was a teacher and she would go teach in Wisconsin in the 1920s when she was like 18 or 19. Then she came back and she met her husband and married, married him. Her husband went to was in the war and her mom and dad moved to Wisconsin 
And then they didn't know it. And finally, when he got out, his dad, Shalon was his name, had moved out there trying to find better honey. The clover was better, they said, out there. So, and then they just all stayed out there. So it's an interesting story about the family. I guess. The pictures are cool because it's hard for me to find pictures. I have to dig and dig and dig. But this one, I finally spoke to a family member who sent me these pictures and they actually used the pictures on their honey jars, which is really kind of cool. Yeah. I got to believe that Madison was probably a pretty good place to keep bees. I have working bees out there for about 10 years. So, <laughs> Oh, that's neat. He worked for the Department of Wildlife. It's neat because you, you, you just, I love researching and they'll stay in my head and then I'll open something up and then I'll find something about them. And I'm like, <laughs> score. Yeah. You know, so it's kind of, it's kind of neat. How many of these, I guess, columns have you written for Jerry so far? Nine. And he, he's sitting on three. I'm dyslexic. So I've always wanted to write these stories and do a book. And I, I thought, well, it's impossible. But then, I'm persistent. I do like to tell a story. So I thought I'm just going to sit down and take a class and figure this out so that I don't write like I talk and start, you know, putting it all in the proper way. And it just, I just got into it. I, I can't stop now. I'm sure Jerry's not just sitting on your stories. He's waiting to release them in the proper order. Oh, he right? is. <laughs> yeah, okay. He is. Okay, I just he is. <laughs> Yeah, no, he's not just sitting around. He, yeah, but now I, I feel like, you know, I, we get busy with bees and you get so busy. So the wintertime, I like to, to do the stories. And, and I like just reading these books all the time. There was a funny woman, Mrs. Thorson. She wrote in and said that she really liked Mrs. Axel's dress and the bloomers. And she didn't mind if it dragged a heavy dress. And then A.I. Root wrote in and he's like, could you devise a, another dress that's not so conspicuous? So A.I. Root was funny. He would he, he would give these women some really quirky answers. You brought it up before and because you said you had a prior knowledge of and history enjoying fashion. Can you talk about the women's beekeeping fashion back in the day, back in the 1870s, 18, late 1800s? Okay, you have Mrs. Wilson. She was C.C. Miller's right hand. He married Sidney Wilson, so her sister came along. She did all of his comb honey, and she would buy brown blue jean fabric to make these aprons. The apron is in the 1891 ABJ. She would make her own bee veil, and she made her own bee gloves. And Miss Harrison, prior to her, did the same thing. She would make a dress. It was just a, like a a sack dress, we call it, and she would put it over her undergarment, which was a white cotton button-down top with sleeves, and she would cut cut it in half, her bloomer. She wouldn't make it one whole piece, and I, I understand why she cut it in half. So she would cut it in half, and she had the bloomers. Then she'd put on these socks all the way up to her knees over the bloomers, and she would wear slippers and then she had an apron over the sack dress and they were heavy fabrics. And then her veil was just like a green mesh with a pasteboard, flat pasteboard tacked around. And it had a calico vest like it kind of reminds me of when you go to the dentist, you know, when you get x-rayed, that big heavy thing that lays on you. That's kind of what went on the front and around. And that was her bee outfit. And people complain about the heat buildup in today's beekeeping suits. That must have been horrible during the Midwest summers. They would sweat really badly. And I think that's why when Mrs. Wilson came along, she eliminated two layers under that skirt and said it was just too heavy to wear around. And then now the woman that I'm doing now, Mrs. Scott, she was born in 1887. So she is actually wearing denim white denim overalls like C.C. Miller would wear. C.C. Miller would wear white denim overalls. So the women are, I'm getting into the generation where the women are wearing pants now and not doing the skirts like they did. Did any of those women, I mean, you mentioned C.C. Miller and some of the other notable beekeepers of the day, were any of these women ever asked to speak at meetings, give how-to demonstrations or any of that? Yeah, Mrs. Tupper. 
She was born in 1822. She was the first one to go to like the North American Beekeepers Association. She would bring the women in from the temperance movement to um, teach them liberal arts so that they didn't have to do home mech. They would go, I think it was in Chicago was the big state meeting. And there were 36 women there. They gave them a discount on the train to go. She she got that for them that they didn't have to pay full fare and they could go. So they were treated with a lot of respect. Yeah, T- Tupper was. She she um, Huber was her friend. Wagner was her friend. Adam Grimm was her friend. She believed in Johann Dijerjan. She she followed him in her parthenogenesis. She believed totally believed in that. She was the first one really when she wrote. It was all science and educational. Where the other women came along, like Mrs. Harrison, they kind of corresponded with each other like girlfriends would. You know, like I've got this much honey this year, or I'm doing this. Where Mrs. Tupper was more on the the political and the science part of it. She didn't like write just to say hi to her friends like the women after her have done. It was their there was their way of staying in contact with each other. That's fun. Yeah. And they would they would upset each other, but you'd have to wait till the next article came out and they would say, (laughs) Well, she was wrong. So yeah. There was no Instagram. Nothing's changed. Yeah. 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 I was gonna say. (laughs) Although it's just a little bit slower. There's no immediate feedback from uh, dislike or uh, trolling as you do in today's social media. (laughs) Oh, no, they would write it and they were really blunt about it. Well, I'm not going to wear that veil because it's just not it's too hot and it's too heavy. So they they yeah, they were still women. Put it that way. (laughs) (laughs) Were there any of these people working with their husbands? Now, that's really interesting because. That comes up. The only one that really worked with her husband was Mrs. Axel. They worked hand in hand together. And then Miss Harrison's husband finally came on after 10 years and helped her. But no, no. Oberlin, he was the grandfather, the father. But no, it, it, that's Mrs. Axel's husband. She worked with him. Now, the one I just did, Mrs. Acklin, yes, she uh, worked with her husband. And Mrs. Axlin, her story, was kind of interesting because I found a picture of a little girl that sang some songs. C.C. Miller used to sing songs and write songs before all of his big meetings. He would get up and he would sing these songs and all the stuff he wrote. So he, this Mrs. Ackland's daughter, Elizabeth, I think it was Elizabeth, she sang. And I'm like, she's an Ackland. And then I came across Mrs. Helen Ackland. I said, they got to be mother and daughter. And they were. And what's really neat, that article is coming out. She's connected to A.I. Root. Her daughter married Howard Root Calvert, Calvert. So he was killed in a, a plane crash in 1929 or 24. That was a really interesting story because I had to really dig and find articles in the paper. And then things just started coming together. Her husband, Mrs. Ackland's husband, worked with her, but then he had passed away. So I'm not going to give the story away, but these two women, the mother and daughter, had parallel lives, very much, very similar lives. Have you ever seen the songbook that C.C. Miller published? Yes, yes. Back in the day when I was the editor, I worked, I had a copy, have a copy, and I tried to find somebody that would... I love that. (laughs) Somebody that would play those so that we could record them. That would be fun to do, Jeff. We should get somebody to do that and play that as background music on our. It would be because people don't realize that that they were very into the singing and the music before our meetings. <laughs> there were of all of these people that you kind of talked about the one you liked probably the most. You mentioned one that was probably a crook of some kind. Of all of these people, which is the one that you respect the least because of the way that they talked about other beekeepers or, you know, things that they did? Does that person exist? Kim's asking you to spread the dirt on some <laughs> some beekeeper. <laughs> I can't really say because they were women in hard times. And a lot of these women married men 12 years older than them and nine years older than them. And they came back from the Civil War. So they were stuck in circumstances that I don't know how I would handle it if if I had to. If it's a white lie, I think a lot of like their friends covered for them, like Lizzie Cotton. 
Okay. She was called not Lizzie Cotton because people called her a swindler and a, they called her a man. She wasn't that attractive, but I think she had Bright's disease. So the public picked on her and she had nine kids. And I really believe it. She was, I saw her birth certificate. She was a woman. And I just think she got a bad rap and married a guy that was older than her, that took advantage of her, that was a teacher and could read and write. And because she was a woman, I think he put her out there to get orders and to get things, but, but they weren't delivering. They, they were scamming people. They got caught. And Mrs. Harrison said that she was a nice woman and kind of covered for her. There was a school teacher that came to town and wanted to buy some bees and told Miss Harrison she had called Mrs. Tupper, but she didn't get her bees in the mail yet. But Miss Harrison didn't say a bad thing about her. Okay. She she kind of covered her for her. So I think they kind of protected each other because things were so hard. But Lizzie Cotton, she got a bad rap. And you can go online, it's in the main library, and you could get her book, Controllable Beehive. It's like 120 pages takes a half hour to read it. It's a pretty neat little book. But yeah, I think out of all of them, she got a bad rap and so did Mrs. Tupper for being uh, accused of forgery and going to jail. Well, keep that in mind, Jeff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't want to do that for sure. And this is really fascinating, Nina. It was a different time, so many different variables, but it's very similar in so many ways. But like you said, it was a different time with different social norms. I mean, I can only imagine the lives that they lived. Marrying somebody who's, what, eight, ten years older? And a lot of them were not, were, were not well. Mr. Tupper's health faded away like the dew before the sun, Mrs. Tupper said, and his money when he came back. He was 57 years old when he came back from the Civil War. So, and you had Mrs. Chaddock's husband was a sharpshooter. You had, I, there's another lady I didn't mention, Ludemia Bennett. I really like her because she was part of OSBA and wrote the uh, Constitution. She was treasurer. She was married, then got divorced. She was 15 and her hus husband was like 60. So Whoa. you can only imagine what that poor woman went through. And she was part of the temperance movement big time. Well, that would do it, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I, I just kind of try to put myself in their shoes. And she she did Queens. She was a big beekeeper. They held their own, these women. I mean, it, it couldn't have been easy. If I wanted to do what you've done, you know, delve into the past and some of these people where you mentioned, I think some of these articles were published in both Gleanings and Bee Culture and the American Bee Journal. But are there other books out there that that I could find and, and, you know, pick up on? Well, not new books. I just think you can go. No, I don't know. I, I know Tammy Horn had, I, I, I try not to read other people's stuff. So I don't feel like I'm, I'm in their head, follow me and I'm doing my own thing. And behind me, I have all these books back here, a wall. Dana Stallman was very kind to give me a lot of, lot of books. And that's my, my archive. I go through all my Glennings, my ABJ. I have these 1891. I have 1871 ABJs. So I can just, that's my resource. I know you could go online and go through the archives of ABJ and Gleanings and start just looking and finding articles about people and, and women. Kim's been eyeing your bookshelves this entire show. <laughs> Kim, I have the... Uh, American Bee Journal, 1861, the original one, the first one that came out. And it's in mint condition. Wow. I, I love it. I love <laughs> old books. Have you explored the library, the USDA library at Beltsville? No, no. That's on my bucket list. Okay. I don't know what's there, but I'm going to guess that there will be some there also. Old agriculture books. See, that, I would just, I love that stuff. Even, I haven't even gotten into, um, Cornell, you've got Anna Comstock. Yeah. I'm not there yet. She's on. I'm going by dates, okay? And upstate New York and her husband and her story. It's incredible because she was her husband's helpmate for so long. And when she married him, he was the genius scientist. But she was brilliant. But, but then again, women didn't have 
the rights to jump ahead of their husbands. She did, she became first professor in like eight, 1920. They, they took it away from her at first because the conservative board didn't feel she should have it. And then she prevailed in 1920 and became first woman professor. But her drawings are incredible and her ink work. And she did all the drawings for her husband. So, yeah, that there's just so much out there. It sounds like down the road we're going to be able to do this again when you're talking about some of these other people. Can we get you to come back again? Oh, sure. That'd be great. Yeah, I, I love it. Yeah, thank you. I'm just, you know, with so many things with bees and mites and this and that, I'm just so glad I have something fresh and different to talk about. <laughs> That's all. No one knows about it yet, but we need to know our history because it's through these men these women would have never gotten into beekeeping if they didn't know the, the Langstroths of the world first. Follow me? And then it's not his story. It's her story now. But it's through the men. And then the women came. And they're important. Well, we definitely appreciate you taking the time to join us this afternoon. This is a fascinating story that I think really does need to be told and relived. And these are people that left their mark in beekeeping. I'm glad you're telling their story. And your story is in Bee Culture, a sponsor of Beekeeping Today podcast. And you've had, what, three out already? And there's three more in the, in the queue? They, he's, they've done, I think, nine. So you have pictures. You have full stories. I encourage our listeners to go out and check out Bee Culture magazine for Nina's continuing series on women in beekeeping. Thanks for joining us. Good, good idea. Yeah. And, you know, I, I too, Tammy Horn, when I met her, she was delightful. I knew she had stories too, and but I thought I'm just going to dig deeper. And she was so kind and and made me feel even better that I just want to keep doing it. She was, you know, which was really neat. So that that was good women together, you know, because sometimes people don't want to share and stuff. And she was just delightful. So I have to say, it's it's pretty good. The stories need to be told. Okay, well, Nina, this has been fun. Thank you for joining us today. And I look forward to, we look forward to down the road a little bit when you've got some more people to talk about. Okay, great, guys. Thank you so much and have a good day. Thanks, You Nina. too. Okay, bye. Kim, I was checking on this. You know, a $20 queen back in 1800s, 1890. You know how much that would be today? A couple hundred bucks, I'll bet. 600 and, <laughs> 670 bucks. Roughly. That's an expensive bug. That is very. <laughs> how would you like to go to Italy, bring back? Oh, and man. then lose, and then lose half of them on the, the way there. Yeah. Oh my oh. gosh. Well, this was fun. I thought twenty five, forty dollars is expensive for a queen. Six hundred yep. seventy dollars. <laughs> Yikes. Uh, well, like I said, this was fun. She's uh, she touched on a lot of things, and and I hope it stirs some people's interest in. Uh, uh, get some to go read the rest of the articles that she's got out there. It's really amazing the people who blaze the trail for beekeepers. I mean, we we go to meetings, we see other beekeepers, we get involved in the hobby or in the profession. It's rare that you think back on all those people who really, like I said, blaze that trail and help make it what it is today. So I'm glad that Nina was here to share the story uh, about the women in beekeeping. That was very, very, very good. Well, that about wraps it up for this episode. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts, wherever you download and stream the show. Even better, write a review and let other beekeepers looking for a new podcast know what you like. You can get there directly from our website by clicking on reviews along the top of any web page. As always, we thank Bee Culture, the magazine for American beekeeping, for their continued support of Beekeeping Today podcast. We want to thank our regular episode sponsors, Global Patties and Strong Microbials and Better Bee for their longtime support of this podcast. Thanks to Hive Alive for returning this spring and thanks to Northern Bee Books for their generous support. Check out all of their books at www.northernbeebooks.co.uk. And finally, and most importantly, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on this show. Feel free to leave us questions and comments at leave a comment section under each episode on the website. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks a lot, everybody.